Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Team Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. (laughs) Hello, (laughs) Rhonda. (laughs) Hello, David, and welcome to the listeners all around the world and galaxy. This is the Feeling Good Podcast, episode 372, and as all our guests are special, we do have a very special guest today, Elise Munoz, Dr. Munoz. Let me just read a brief introduction about her. She's an adolescent and adult psychotherapist. She's an educator, and she's founder of the group private practice, the Feeling Good Psychotherapy Center in New York. And she has a deep passion for advancing the field of mental health and has dedicated her career to providing compassionate and evidence-based therapy to people of all edges. Elise earned her doctorate in clinical social work at the University of Pennsylvania. We're always talking about outcome studies, and we're really excited that her dissertation research was groundbreaking, and it was on Team CBT for Adolescent and Young Adults with Depression and Anxiety, testing short-term impact and within session change. And that research reflects Elise's commitment to both understanding and improving the therapeutic interventions for youth and adults. Elise, in addition to her doctorate degree, holds master's degrees in clinical and child adolescent psychology and a master's degree in clinical social work. She's an adjunct assistant professor at New York University. She's a guest speaker at the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Southern California Schools of Social Work. She created the Feeling Good Psychotherapy Center, where she and her staff treat clients in New York City, in that surrounding tri-state area, including New Jersey and Connecticut, and they're expanding across the East Coast. And the one really cool thing about the Feeling Good Psychotherapy Center is that they're an in-network provider with a lot of major health insurance plans so that they can keep the cost of Team CBT low. And we want to really welcome you, Elise, to our podcast where you can talk about your incredible dissertation research. And I understand your research is going to be published pretty soon. So maybe we could talk about that as well. Thank Good you, to Rhonda. see you, Elise. I haven't seen you in person for, it seems like, ages, but I have an important question before you answer all those great questions that Rhonda just uh, asked. She was t- talking about all the stuff you've been doing in addition to getting, you know, a PhD, and I was just wondering, what do you do with all of your spare time? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. So I I actually do um I do have a lot of hobbies. I do enjoy them. And as you know, um I recently um moved to Florida, so I've been enjoying a lot of golf on the weekends. Oh, oh I had and no idea you'd thing. moved to Florida. That's awesome. Right. Yeah, do you Yeah, love I'm, it there I'm in back Florida? and forth. Well, during the pandemic, we started coming here in the winter. And um, so we decided to to get a place here. And so I'm back and forth between New York and Florida. I see. Now. So you've, your wonderful center is still happening. Well, tell us all about your center, mm-hmm. yourself, your life, your research, your your doctorate work and all these uh, ama- amazing things that you've been doing. Oh, thank you for asking. Um, so much has been going on um, during my doctorate in clinical social work. At UPenn, I conducted a retrospective naturalistic study for my dissertation work. And this research focused on adolescents and young adults who received team therapy for anxiety and depression. 
And these were clients in my group practice um, between 2017 and 2021. The study examined data for 116 young people between the ages of 13 and 24. And we analyzed results after 10 sessions of treatment. They actually had an average of 27 sessions in total. But I was interested in seeing how much improvement would occur in a very brief period. And since college counseling centers and other brief treatment centers focus on 10 sessions or less, I decided to look at the 10 session mark. And results were very encouraging. Um, so for example, 80% of the depressed clients moved from the clinical range of symptoms into the subclinical range. Please and, say that once again, because I'm taking notes and I lost sure. you there. Sure. So one of the hypotheses in the study was that the mood symptoms would be lower after 10 sessions versus sure. before. Pre so what did you see there if, after 10 sessions? That's the part I didn't get. So after 10 sessions for depression symptoms, 80% of the clients were in the subclinical range. So, And how do you define that? that? For our lay li listeners that aren't therapists. Sure. So the subclinical range means that the client had little to no symptoms or what we call borderline symptoms, which would be- On, from, on what test? On the brief mood survey. So that would be from a zero to a four. A zero to a four? Yes. Wow. 80% of your clients had scores between zero and four after 10 sessions? Yes. That's fantastic. Where, where where were they at before that, when they started? So I can tell you that 30%, for example, in the depression category, were in the few to no symptoms or borderline symptoms. So 30% were in the subclinical category to start because some of them had anxiety and some had depression, but not everyone had both. So 30% were in the subclinical range beforehand, and 80% were in the subclinical after the 10 sessions. So that means the normal range and the borderline range. And people with borderline symptoms, they have... They and what are you defining symptoms. as a borderline symptom? Is that would be the two to four on the brief mood survey. So um, clinicians will be familiar with this, but for... The lay people listening, if you're in the borderline range, you're not quite in the mild range of symptoms, but you still have some symptoms going on, but you're feeling a lot better. Yeah, that's that, that that's neat. It, the um, you looked at at ten weeks at uh, at your your patients as a whole, which is a, a smart thing to do. Uh, I'm trying to think of if you looked at the, the group who who were not in the real low scores there, say they were above four on, on the brief mood survey at, at intake, what percentage of those got down in, into that range of zero to four? You might so not those, have done that, but I'd, I'd be curious. So those were the 80%. So the people that were in the mild to extreme category, 80% of those were then in the borderline or the normal range. Afterwards. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. That, that's that's really, uh, really amazing. Lots yeah. amazing, at least. <laughs> <laughs> way, to, way to go. That's pretty, yeah. pretty fantastic. Really positive, right? And for the anxious clients who were in the mild to the extreme category, 87% were then in the borderline range or the normal range after 10 sessions. So anxiety uh, improved even more than the depression. 87% yeah. of the patients were in that zero to four range. And these, for those of you who are listening who don't know, my depression test and my anxiety test both go from zero to 20, zero being no symptoms whatsoever, and 20 being the worst a human being can feel. And and so 
if 80 or 87 percent of the of the patients initially who, who weren't already in that range went down to that range, that's pretty mind-boggling, rapid, and extreme degree of improvement. Yes. Wow. We'll keep talking. I will sh shut yeah. up now. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was the first hypothesis. And the second one was that the number of sessions would be positively correlated with an improved outcome. So we looked at people who had at least 10 sessions, but some of them had less. So we looked at the 10 or less, and we put those into two groups. And the clients that had less than 10 sessions didn't show a significant difference in their post-session score, which is very interesting. This may suggest that significant change can occur in less than 10 sessions. And we know that significant change can occur in an individual session, right? Like David, you you demonstrate that frequently in your live therapy demonstrations. Hmm. So that you was said that cl clients with less than 10 sessions had no improvement or improvement or I'm quite, quite they, not sure. Less than 10 sessions didn't have a significant difference in their post-session scores than the ones that had 10 sessions. Uh, had, had, had no improvement, uh, but people who had 10 sessions or more were the ones who had the significant improvement. No, they did have improvement. They actually did improve, and their scores were good, but they may have left. They may have stopped treatment after a few sessions. Oh, so they know. also had significant improvement. They also showed significant improvement. Oh, oh okay. That's that's encouraging also. Yeah, so they also had the people who had 10 sessions or less, their post-brief mood survey scores were reduced indicating that they had an improvement in their depression and anxiety. They improved yeah. as much, it sounds yeah. like, as, as the right. ones who had more than 10 sessions. Uh, yeah, it, in, interesting. Exactly. Um, right. Do, does that mean that uh, once they get their benefit, that additional sessions don't add anything more, that, that there might not be a reason to keep you know, the, the treatment going for long periods of time? That was my guess. I do think that sometimes it's possible, I would need to do a study on this to find out, but it's possible that people just get relief after a few sessions and then decide that, oh, I don't, I don't think I need to go to therapy anymore or, you know, for whatever reason, um, they, they decide that they don't want to invest in it anymore or, um, I'm not sure. It would be interesting to do a study on that. Yeah, that that's right. And that's the same kind of thing we're looking at uh, with, with our app. And because, you know, relapse can be very high with people. They can gain a lot within a session and then give back between sessions. Exactly. Exactly. And that's an important point that the average number of sessions was 27. Right. So treatment really wasn't over. All we know is that the after session score at session 10 was in this range. So yeah. the, the, the thought is that it takes more time for people to integrate these skills and these tools and relapses occur, but people are also learning how to really get good at using the tools with team and how to so, devise So your itself. thinking is that although people can make rapid gains, they may need longer periods of time to maintain those gains. Exactly. But that would still be a hypothesis. It would be a, exactly. It would be a hypothesis. We would need to look in a longer term study at what happens to the mood scores over time. Sure. Because, right. there's, we, yeah, uh, there's a lot of reasons people stay in longer term tr treatment, uh, like, uh, the the you know they may like schmoozing with their patients or the patients like might like schmoozing with the therapist, and also 
if you keep the patient for a longer period of time, it may be an economic advantage for the therapist. You don't have to go and find a new patient. And so there's all kinds of uh, motives go, going on that could could be uh, te teased out, as, as you're saying, uh, by, by further analyses. And those are exactly the kinds of things we're uh, you know, working on looking at with with the app. I know at the Feeling Good Institute, I had a database of um, eleven thousand therapy sessions with I think thirteen hundred patients, and mm -hmm. uh, that was also just like yours, a naturalistic study. And they maxed out their gains at a fifty nine percent reduction again on on my test after five sessions, uh, which was, you know, pretty darn, darn good. But then after that, we would, I would have had to do a lot of work on figuring out why, from a practical point of view, the gains within sessions after that were equaled by the relapses between sessions. That's why they plateaued. But also there were people dropping out all along the way and, We'd have to go back and figure out, is that because the people were dropping out because they were feeling better or because they were not liking the therapist anymore? You know, there's so many of these questions that are basic common sense questions that have never been answered. And it's so mm -hmm. exciting that you're doing the kind of fantastic analyses that you're doing and studies that you're doing. I I stand up and applaud you here. I'm not standing, but I'm applauding. I'll applaud into the into the microphone so you'll hear it. But uh, that's that's really neat, Elise. Fantastic way to go. I, you know, I've been thinking a lot about what happens after that reduction in mood scores. And I think that beyond relapse, I think that there are other things that people want to work on in therapy. True. For example, adolescents and young adults, they really want to talk about their relationships, right? For younger people, it's friendships, it's being in the right clique, it's finding a romantic partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, what have you. Young adults, they think a lot about their relationships, a lot about their work, finding their purpose in life, just general well-being. I, I spent a lot of time with my daughter on that. As you know, exact thing when she was a freshman in high school is how to prevent boys from manipulating you and how to counter manipulate boys. And uh, it was very good education for her and training and fun for me. And and you're, you're, you're right about that. And of course, at all ages in life, we're concerned about relationships and Lately, we've been, you know, talking a little bit about the, the the topic of loneliness in people of of all ages. I was doing work with a young fellow. He's he's not as young as as these kids are, but he's he, he's in his his twenties and and a and, and a brilliant, uh, attractive young fellow who's uh, st studying advanced computer stuff, cutting edge in Switzerland. He came for depression. Uh, and uh, uh, he agreed to do a demonstration session, so we have a video of it. But you'd think he's got the world by, by the tail because he's handsome, he's charming, he has a great sense of humor, he's he's really smart, you know, just a thoroughly pleasant person. But his his depression scores were about the highest I've seen. I, I was shocked at the beginning of the session, and. You'd never know that he's feeling that way inside. And he's been hiding all of his feelings from everybody because, you know, he thinks he has to be perfect. I, I, I call it, as you know, perceived perfectionism. And I used to have those kinds of feelings myself a lot. And, uh, and so he never has opened up to anyone about how he's feeling inside because he's certain they'll reject him once they find out he's had intense depression, uh, you know, real severe anxiety and security. He thinks he, he he's defective and, and, and he's been, you know, very alone and lonely. And I, I think the world is filled with people, young people and people of all ages mm -hmm. who are hiding and trying to present themselves a false front to, to, to the world. And he was so delightful to work with because he even thought that I was rejecting him that he called me Professor Burns 
Uh, I'm the only person. He's I, he's the only person who's ever called me Professor Burns. I don't know if anyone calls you Professor now, but it's, no. it's the first time it ever happened. But he had one of his thoughts on his daily mood log is uh, once Professor Burns get, gets to know me, you know, see how I really am. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not good enough, and he'll he'll reject me. And it was so sad that someone so appealing can have so little you know, sense of self-love, but uh, it, it had a good, good a, a great outcome because I, toward the end of the session, I, I said, how would you find out how Professor Burns really feels about you? And he was hemming and hawing, and oh, I'd have to watch him and see if he seems annoyed and all this indirect stuff. I said, Xavier, which is his name, all that mind reading stuff is it, absolutely inaccurate. You can't tell how people feel. Uh, but just by observing them, you get all these ideas in your head, but they'll almost always be wrong. Can you think of any other method? And he he he's real smart, and he's getting nervous and hemming and hawing. And, and finally, he said, uh, "Well, I suppose I could ask him." And, and and then he got real nervous. I said, "Why don't you try that?" And so he said, "Well, do you think less of me because you found out I'm not, you know, the way." I presented myself initially and, and that I'm really so defective and insecure. And he's also struggled with chronic pain of unknown origin. Hmm. And, uh, and, and I, I just told him, you, you know, I said, I just feel so close to you to, to, to see your vulnerability and how you really feel inside. Hmm. And uh, he, he just couldn't believe it. I mean, he, he just became euphoric that he could just be himself and have somebody really like him and think that, that he's awesome. And then after the session, he went out and started asking the people working in his lab saying, you know, I've, 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 I've never told anyone this, but I'm, I've really pretty feel horribly depressed a lot of the time inside. And I wonder if you think I'm crazy or if you think less of me and what, what courage it took for him to do that. And every, and I, he said, everyone's been telling me they, they actually, the same as what you said, and he says, I'm I'm on a high, you know, telling people what what a failure I am and how defective I am. And, and then he decided to do rejection practice. You know that technique? Oh, I yeah, love that technique. Yeah. And, and so he, he, he started noticing attractive young ladies and he was climbing in the gym on a wall. And he noticed the, the young woman next to him was like super good looking. And, and, and he said, pardon me, did, could I ask you a question? She said, sure. And, and he said, I'm, I'm trying to get over my fear of rejection. And, and I'm wondering if you'd be willing to reject me, because that would really help me. And she says, no, I can't do that, but I'd be happy to give you my phone number. <laughs> he couldn't believe it. <laughs> so anyway, but, but I, I know that thing with young people, you know, why, and my daughter felt that way. I'm not one of the popular people. And she thought she could never be one of the popular people. And she thought it was something you were born with rather than a skill set. Yeah, I remember you shared some stories about that with me once, David, about um, those wonderful tips that you gave your daughter yeah and yeah. and you know based on that concept that human beings only want what they can't have easily yeah, right and playing a little a little hard to get and being yeah. a little aloof yeah. in that confident way really really helped her do you use and that stuff that with your patients oh all the time all the oh, time that is I'm, so I'm neat no wonder they're it. getting such elevations in their mood scores. I have a I question for you, Elise. Yes, please. So you ha you've told me, and I forgot to say it in the introduction, that you have 26 therapists at the Feeling Good Psychology Psychotherapy Pro Center, and they provide, what did you tell me, 2,000 hours of therapy each month between the 26 therapists that work there? And right. you, your study had 116 young people, and I'm wondering... Were you the therapist for all of them? Were there therapists from your center part of your study? And how did you control for therapist um, skills? I'm glad you asked that question because I did want to talk about that. I think that given the 
team CBT is a pretty sophisticated approach. Would you agree with that, David? Oh, yeah, that yeah. I think it's incredibly. In fact, I made a list this week of all the reasons therapy can fail. And I came up with uh, 25 at least. Wow. And I said, man, this is so damn complicated. It, it's incredibly complex to learn a very sophisticated model. And as you've pointed out, the agenda setting piece, especially, yeah. that can take a long time to learn because you have to unlearn what you learned in graduate school. Right. Right. You learn in graduate school how to rescue the client, how to, um, you know, not challenge the client too much in, in just that kind of more codependent style of working. So it does require a lot of training. When I created my group practice, I was in solo practice and I was working on my level four team training. And I, I realized that there were only so many hours in a day that I could provide therapy. And I was seeing such amazing results with the team model that I decided to hire some of the people I was training and transform my practice into a group practice. And in exchange for people working for me, I would offer them an amazing intensive therapy um, training in-house. So the therapists during, to get back to your question, Rhonda, so the therapist that produced this data in the study there were 15 of them that was over a period of three years Mm. and all of the therapists received first when they were hired I did a boot camp for them over the weekend so just an intensive training of the model they had to do reading homework etc and then once they were working for the practice we have two hours a week of team training and consultation and one hour a week of individual team training and consultation. And many of the therapists went and got more training on top of that. Some people um, sought outside training on their own time just to get more of it. Um, Some people did training in childhood and adolescent work. Um, Some people went and did some of Jill Levitt's training. Actually, some of the people in your group came to the Wednesday group, I think, because I recall them telling me they were working for you. Yes, that's right. I sent some of them to the Wednesday group as well. So um, training is a big piece, especially because team therapy at the time was newer on the East Coast. So I wanted to make sure that people really learned the model really well and that they moved up the rungs of team certification and so forth. So people were highly trained and received ongoing training. Oh, every week, actually. And then once they learn the model, then we had an advanced training group with uh, the team method focusing on specific disorders. Did you see significant differences in outcomes associated with the therapist identity? The therapist identity, you mean their cultural identity? No, 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 no. No, most therapists like have a name. And so you can enter them as variables into outcome oh. equations and, and see if yes. who the therapist is has any effect on how much the patient improves. And we, we were talking about, I was telling you, the, the method I used to use for doing that at the initial session, but you can do that over the course of therapy too, over the 10 sessions, is there variation among therapists, you have to assume random assignment and, you know, but, but when controlling for initial depression, then you can see how much each improves either within the first session or over the first 10 sessions. And then you can see if there are, you may not have had the the time or resources to do that kind of analysis, but it would be interesting to, to, to see if there were some therapists and to put it in humble street terms, some therapists who were getting much better, faster results than other therapists. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. I actually did try to analyze the effectiveness of the therapist based on their team level, whether they were level two or level three, et cetera. But it was my my hypothesis there before you leak it out is it would be (laughs) totally meaningless in terms of improvement. But now we'll find out the truth. 
So the reality was that I couldn't measure it because people had moved up during that time period. So it was too difficult to figure out what level they were at when they saw that specific client, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. They were moving up the levels. They were training all the time. So it wasn't wasn't a good way to look at it by analyzing their team level or their outcome. But I, I think it would be a great study to look at therapist effectiveness because there are some very interesting studies on that that show that um, therapists differ in their effectiveness, right? It, it depends on, it doesn't really depend yeah, that, on- That's what I saw at the Feeling Good Institute. And we could measure their effectiveness with a high degree of accuracy in their first session with patients. And there was an amazing range. And we measured the change in patient symptoms on a scale from plus 100% to minus 100% with each therapist. And so what plus 100% would be the therapist caused total recovery in the first session. And minus mm-hmm. 100% would mean that the therapist caused the worst deterioration possible in the first session. And there was people were all over the range there. And where, wherever patients, the therapist fell on that spectrum had massive predictive power on the effectiveness all throughout therapy to the end Mm. of therapy. Wow. That's it. So interesting. I I did in my study find out that the biggest reduction in symptoms occurred in the first session. So Uh, yeah, yeah. And you can link the amount you see to the therapist's identity in a variety of ways, Uh, Hmm. you know, depending on how, how you want to measure uh, measure the improvement, like is it the percent reduction in the depression score or or, or what, or the d- percent d- deterioration in the depression score. And that's how you can find out exactly how effective each therapist is. And the amount of improvement they get in the first session will be the ultimate final uh, analysis of that therapist's mm-hmm. effectiveness. It it's all happens in the very first session. And it probably doesn't have to do with a lot of the variables we think, like their t- I'm, I would think their team certification doesn't have anything to do with that. But patients bring into the first session, you could say, a placebo potential. In other words, some patients have the capacity to improve a lot in the first session, and other patients are coming in, you know, all negative and resistant, and their mom wants them to be there, but they don't. They're... They're, they bring a lot of resistance into the first session. But it seems like some therapists have a, a potential to hook into the patient's responsiveness, like mm. how much potential the patient has to improve and get at that right away in the first session. And, mm. and as you saw, a lot of the, the therapists score big in the very first session. And and then others do, do not. And and that and they don't overcome that. Uh, you know, in later sessions, the good ones get better and the bad ones do do, do not. Uh, hmm. it, it, it just it was an interesting uh, f- f- phenomenon. I was trying to explain that in some emails to, to you, but it, it was a hard concept to ex- explain the mathematics of how to calculate that, what I call the recovery coefficient. But it could it could still be be done with with your data if you had the interest uh, but it's neat. Tell us more. I will shut up. I talk too much. Rhonda will attest to that. <laughs> no, I would never say that. <laughs> At least one of the things that you said, and David mentioned it too, is that you used a naturalist study. And because so many of our listeners are not psychologists or therapists who know about the methodology, can you explain what you meant by that? Sure. So it was a retrospective naturalistic study, retrospective meaning that the data was from completed treatments. So it was from data in the past. And, you know, so no client that was currently being seen was involved in the study. The naturalistic part means that it's a natural environment of real treatment, right? So if you think about randomized controlled trials. And for the listener, that means that you have one group that gets one treatment and then you have a control group. And then you have another group that gets a different treatment. 
they tend to screen out the clients, right? They'll take clients that don't have, let's say they're studying anxiety, that don't have any other mental health problems. In a naturalistic study, we're just using clients that come in for treatment with whatever symptoms and issues they're struggling with. And we look at treatment effectiveness um, based on what actually happens in real treatment. So it's it's much more organic than constructing a study to look at a particular thing with research subjects that sign up for the study. So this is real treatment. Yeah. I applaud you for doing that. That's what I did my entire career because like yourself as a clinician, I couldn't do controlled outcome experiments. I had to give the best I had to every patient who came to our clinic in Philadelphia, but we did have them sign a consent form if we could use their data anonymously and, and, and research to find out how the therapy worked. And almost all of them were more than happy to give that permission and then was able to learn things as, as you're learning with, with your data. And I'm so excited by what you're doing. And I, I wish every clinician uh, you know, in America or in the world would would be doing what mm. you're doing saying what how how effective are we at my clinic and who are the clinicians who are getting the best re results and then you can go beyond that and say what are the variables that are associated with rapid recovery and and that type of thing and it'd be interesting to see at what point if you looked at your data as a whole with all the the patients and, and you looked at the mean at every session at what session number the means leveled out that that's that's when the improvement stops if you see what i mean yes actually that was another one of our exploratory hypotheses was to look at the pattern of treatment response over time and what i found was there was an upward trajectory of improvement from session 1 to session 4 and then session 6 to session 9 and a slight plateau from session four to six. So um, that's very much in line with what you're saying, that there is a curvy linear response yeah. to treat. You got most of your improvement in the first five sessions and then it tended to plateau out after that. And that's precisely what I saw in the data from the Feeling Good Institute. Uh, Yes, and, and I just thought that was like uber exciting. I was so excited, but no one else seemed excited about what I was seeing. I thought it was fantastic. And then we saw too, you know, how there's the empathy scale and the helpfulness scale, and mm -hmm. those actually didn't have much uh, causal impact on on changes. A lot of the things that we thought would have causal impact did not. Interesting. We we looked at empathy scores. And one of the hypotheses was that therapists that have better empathy scores would have better outcomes, but we weren't able to test this and analyze it because the scores were so high, the empathy scores were so high that they were skewed to the right. So there wasn't that, that in no way prevents you from analyzing the data. And if you send it to me, I'll be glad to analyze it with structural equation modeling. Uh, but 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 the, the, okay. it's just from the Human Institute. And uh, it was, you know, because they'd all been trained in my Tuesday group, so they all had pretty, most of them had pretty good, but there was still a range uh, in, in response, mm -hmm. and that range was not particularly associated with, uh, you know, changes in, in outcome. But your point is is well taken, that you may have to have some Hitler-like therapists in there with terrible empathy scores to see that <laughs> empathy has something to do with with outcomes but i think it's it's very difficult to uh to show that empathy has causal effects on on outcomes because therapists are always saying oh it's the the, the therapeutic alliance that does all of the healing mm -hmm. but I'm, I, what, what's the therapeutic alliance if it isn't for empathy the trust the warmth I, I don't know maybe alliance has some other notion in, intertwined in it but the helpfulness that would be like the alliance also my therapist and i are working together on the relevant things and i'm learning helpful techniques and that scale also d didn't seem to have any uh, yeah. particularly noteworthy causal effects on degree of improvement and that's why i love science because it it, it shoots you down most of what you think you know 
That's very interesting because we always talk about how important getting perfect scores on empathy scales is. And I wonder if there's a range that will allow the person to make progress, let's say it's, between 18 to 20 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it, I don't know. it could be. I always take a 19 or below on the, on the scale as a failing grade because it means there's something I've really missed. And uh, but you can still do good work. The young man that I described earlier, uh, I thought I was getting blow away uh, empathy with him. And then I, I and and he had remarkable changes in the session. I mean, everything went down to zero pretty much. Even his physical pain went almost all the way to zero by the end of the session. And I thought, boy, this guy must love me. And And then I got a 16 on the empathy scale which is like three points below a failing grade. and But I got to talk to him about it, and then it brought us a lot closer, found out, you know, the thing I had missed and how why I hadn't gotten a perfect empathy score. And so, you know, even getting a bad empathy scale grade can be a tremendous benefit in, in, in therapy. Yeah, I agree. I think talking about a failing grade really leads to breakthroughs if it's done skillfully, of course. And it sounds like you did it very skillfully with him and, yeah. and it led I've to an lately, amazing breakthrough. I've lately been thinking that there might be something in addition to empathy that that's important. And it's not talked about, I don't think, uh, but you might know or Rhonda might know, but it's just kind of liking like, I really liked this patient, Xavier, and I could sense that he really liked me, and he, he felt very fortunate to be have, having a session because he sent me an email, and all of a sudden he's getting a wonderful free th therapy session from somebody he's, he's you know, only read about. Or, or, but but I, I, I feel that you can set up a kind of expectation th through warmth and liking and 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 also the therapist's confidence that something magical is probably going to happen in today, and that mm -hmm. that 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 expectation mm -hmm. of magic and it can't be hokey or something, but maybe there's something there that could be measured. Uh, and I'm just babbling away, but uh, young young people like yourself with a big clinic with a big amount of data you know maybe you'll think of some way to put some extra questions in your survey or be able to test some of these ideas because i think getting great results is important one thing we've shown with the app data is that the the improvement has a change in belief and negative thoughts has a massive causal effect uh, we kind of prove the cognitive uh, basic theory, uh, but what yeah. are the things that that lead to the patient being able to lower their belief in their negative thoughts? And of course, the agenda setting is important, and the resistance and the motivation. But I, 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 I you know, I think there are many factors that may be ha happening, and if we can isolate them uh, and identify them. Uh, we we can uh, turn it into a science of psychotherapy, and I don't think we're quite there yet. I still think we've got all these competing schools of psychotherapy. But the neat thing I love about team is is that each patient is a research study because you get a mm -hmm. score at the start and end of every single session. So we're always doing research. I will yeah, try we're clinician. To shut up, clinician again. resources, right? Clinician researchers is what we are in the team approach. I I think of it that way because every time we get feedback from our clients, we're studying, we're comparing right. their progress over time. We're looking at what's working, what's not working. So yeah. we're constantly able to improve, which is just super exciting. Yeah. And I also saw at the Feeling Good Institute that they give about back about a third of their gains between sessions because you can get that by looking at the end of session and the start of the next session. Okay. Uh -huh. and then, and then you, so if you have it in a computer, you can easily do these, these calculations and, and model them and, and, and things like that. But listen, um, sometimes uh, 
podcasts get a little low energy here and what we're doing is exciting to me because I'm kind of a boring uh, researcher. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so I turn to uh, Rhonda, who always injects uh, <laughs> fantastic stuff into the podcast. And uh, I will, uh, she will now that, do that. We just finished the Mexico City intensive in early November. And lots of people asked, well, is there any proof that Team CBT works? You have all these people, they're super enthusiastic about it. And they're talking about how great it is. And they're talking about their own anecdotal experiences. And now what we have is an article that is your research, Elise. And this is, it seems pretty clear proof that Team CBT works. You had a reduction of symptoms at a very high level after 10 sessions. And you had a reduction of symptoms after less than 10 sex sessions. Really after five sessions. After five sessions. Mm -hmm. And that's really exciting. And I wonder how are people going to find out about your research so that it's not just the three of us or the people who are listening to this podcast? After I completed my dissertation, I started writing an article for a scientific journal submission. And it looks like it's been accepted at woo, woo. Cognitive and Behavioral Practice Journal. So that's what's Wait. in the works right now. Way to go. Now, th that elevates your status considerably in the intellectual community, uh, having an article in press. How does that feel to you? It feels exciting. There's still some revisions going back and forth, the things I need to tweak and and formatting and such um but i think when it's published it'll be quite exciting and i think for the team community i think a lot of people have been waiting for a study to come out oh yeah oh, absolutely way to go elise and then when people say to us how do you know it works we can refer them to your article yeah you, yeah. we can say take this you Stupid doubter. <laughs> you cynics. <laughs> well, that's really exciting, Elise. Congratulations on your research. Congratulations on being accepted into a peer-reviewed journal. And great job. Congratulations on setting up an amazing treatment center yeah. called the Feeling Good Psychotherapy Center of New York. And we'll have all of your contact information in there uh, you told us you're in a position you can't treat all of the unhappy teenagers in in new york city but you do have the capacity to take on half of them and so <laughs> after Easily. the podcast uh, uh, people may f may flood you with their uh, kids who are hurting and and wanting some kind of loving and and uh, effective help that that works that works rapidly. And congratulations, not only on setting up that amazing treatment center, and I know it comes from the heart, and I know that when you treat people, it comes through your own personal experience as well with your own daughter and your own family and your own self. And we all think that doing our personal work is a vital part of being a therapist. So it's just not all you know, some formula that you learned at a workshop, but something you've lived through on a personal level. And um, Absolutely. And, can, and then on top of all of this, getting a PhD, how many years did it take you to do? Because usually a PhD is like 10 years of slavery to some narcissistic <laughs> professor who is using you. <laughs> yes, well, it's actually a doctorate in clinical social work. So it was a very applied doctorate focused on evidence-based psychotherapy. It was a three-year program. For you, mm. amazing. And and UPenn is no slouch in the academic world. I know their Department of Psychology is considered, you know, one of the top in, in the world. And I'm sure the department that you were in was very rigorous as well. Is that true? It was wonderful. We had an amazing group of professors, a wonderful cohort. It was it was a wonderful expansive experience and I'm really glad that I did it and it coincided so nicely with you know my interest in oh, doing a yeah. study on team CBT it just all worked out so beautifully 
Um, so did did you live in Philadelphia or was it all via Zoom? It was a hybrid program. So it was supposed to be in person and online. Oh. Um, but it but the program occurred during the pandemic. So a lot of my classes were virtual and some of them were in person. So that was how I was able to do it from New York. Yeah. But I, I ever, definitely you... loved it, loved the program. Oh, sounds great. Do you ever get tired of, the, of all of these? Like you've been a hurricane of productivity. I, and Rhonda's you know, the but, same way, by the way. <laughs> Rhonda, too. I know Rhonda is amazing. She does so many things, including a wonderful job with this podcast. Um, I do a lot of working hard and playing hard. So I, I do have a lot of hobbies. Um, I enjoy, you know, lots of time with friends and colleagues and I, I just love my work. So it's yeah, very it's, rewarding. Yeah. It's great when you love your work. And for, for me, there's nothing better than seeing someone get better within a therapy session. And Rhonda and I had a wonderful one. We're hoping to turn into a podcast with a young woman. Well, she's 40. It seems young to me, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, she, she looks and, Sounds, you know, vital, fantastic young woman. She had the chance to become a world-class ballerina. And uh, let's see. Something's happening here. And she turned down the, that opportunity and has lived for 23 years with regret. And we will definitely be turning that into a podcast, probably coming out in late December or January. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry that you, I lost you there. And uh, yeah, we'll... That, that'll that be a wonderful thing. It was so much fun working with you on that, Rhonda. Oh, it's, I mean, David, you said that Elise works really hard. And then now Elise said, I worked really hard. And you are no slouch in the working hard department. Yeah. I well, think you I, work 14 hours a day. <laughs> I have been for the past uh, six or seven days, really. And um, my wife just said, maybe you need to take a break because I haven't had a vacation in at least 15 years. I've been working seven days a week. Wow, uh, pretty much the whole wow. time, and uh, but yeah, the uh, sometimes us elderly farts uh, get, get tired. I'm starting to notice. Uh, I thought it would never happen, but uh, uh, yeah. Well, at least we really want to thank you for coming on the podcast. We are the what is it when when movies come out? We're the premier discussion of your research, and I'm excited yeah. that we are. Launching yes, the information about it. Congratulations. I've always been fond of you, Elise. I just love you even more now. Uh, and it's I'm just so proud of you and all the things that you've accomplished. I I I have no idea all, all the incredible energy that you've put out and the passion and the intellect that you've put into it. But uh, absolute, absolute admiration and humble thanks for coming and hanging out with us and maybe you'll come and visit us a bit more often in the future and if you're ever out in california you know i've 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 had back pain so i haven't been able to walk hardly but i i actually ron i did two miles this weekend with Ooh, exciting. A, a couple of people who came carlos from our tuesday group oh and nice derek who used to come on the sunday high oh i know derek yeah and uh so we we might get them started up again, but I can't go very far because I, I get this low back pain, but I've, I've been working on it and hope, hopefully it'll, I think it's improving a little. So, oh, goody. but it would be so neat to to hike with you again. Thank you so much, David. I, I so enjoyed the hike that I joined you on in the Los Angeles Hills. Oh yeah. Clear as day. Do you remember what I, we talked about? I do. I remember what we talked about, and and uh, I remember the gorgeous scenery and yeah. just your endurance was amazing. Yeah. I mean, you didn't even you barely broke a sweat, and I think we did. I don't know, ten miles or yeah, something we probably like did. You know, five, eight, ten miles uh, most most Sundays, and uh, I'd, it'd be a dream to be able to get back to that and then working with people live while you're hiking and doing personal work and sometimes i could do as much as work with three people on a, on a hike and then go oh, out yeah. for dim sum uh, i don't know did we go out for dim sum afterwards 
we yeah. did. And we, 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 we had them some. some delivered to the house here by Uber at, oh, two, great. two weeks ago. Uh, Fantastic. Is, isn't that neat? That is uh, fantastic that you can have everything delivered nowadays. Yeah. I know how much you enjoy it, but if I'm ever in California, I I would love to stop by for a hike and yeah. I hope that you do get them going again because they yeah. were super fun and a great way to connect. Yeah. Well, have a great uh, great whatever and and again, thank you from the bottom of my heart and congratulations on the exceptional leadership you've taken and making the clinician uh, researcher, the, uh, I don't know what, the, the ideal of combining research with clinical work has been the model for all of clinical psychology, all of mental health, but only two people in the world have ever done that. Uh, Elise Munoz and David Burns. Oh, uh, that's great. For frauds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for your yeah. time and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks to all care. of you for, for tuning in. And remember, we don't take ads. We have no marketing budget. So if you like the podcast, tell tell your friends you're our only marketing source. And so if you know somebody who's who's hurting and, and needing help, a lot of people say they've recovered or improved a lot from the, listening to the podcast. Or if you know therapists who are looking for some uh, new ideas about therapy, we uh, they might we welcome them as well. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.